Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Scott. How are you today? I'm great, Michael. Thank you. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. And as we just before we press the record button, we we were trying to remember how we crossed paths, weren't we? And it was Laurie Showstrom uh, who introduced yep. us. And she's in Ireland. She's a fellow American for you, obviously, who now lives in Ireland. And yeah, she's a great connector, I think. <laughs> yes, definitely. And she's got quite a story herself. Absolutely. Yeah. And she's been on the podcast a few episodes ago. So yeah, if anybody wants to check out her story, it's it's incredible. The work she's doing for parents and uh, kids is is really, really great. Yeah. Right. So welcome. Um, I just have two questions for you. First question already asked. <laughs> My second question is, uh, Scott, um, <laughs> Why don't we dive in, uh, share us your story, and uh, how did you get to where you are today? Well, that, that question is a, a little more complicated and requires a longer answer than the how are you question. Yes. Um, so I started after getting out of college. I first, first job was for an insurance company uh, for no reason other than they were the first ones to hire me. Right. So nothing special of, about the, the that attracted me there mm. other than they were the first. Yeah. So yeah. over time, I <clears throat> got to learn the business, move up the ranks, um, famous international carrier, and um, got, got to the corner office and management um, after about 13 years with yeah. that yeah. company. And then um, somewhere along the way in those 13 years, they got bought out by another company. And in time, you know, they were introducing their changes. They relocated the company to another state. And um, and I was not a part of those relocation plans. Right. So very disappointing. I actually liked that job. Um, mm. And uh, I thought, hey, I've got a good work record, it won't be any problem to find anything else. And that wasn't the case. This was 2007, right as the economy was starting to get bad. Oh, yes. It had been a very robust job market was was drying up. And so it turned into a long period of unemployment. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes there, things were really rough at home. I, I was locked in a, a really bad marriage. And the as long as there was food on the table, a roof overhead, I was getting along okay. Yeah. Now the food on the table and the roof overhead were becoming quite a challenge. And mm -hmm. so now it was really aggravating things at home. And sadly to the point where i started self-medicating right. um gradually at first in time became a full-blown alcoholic um for work i uh, a friend of mine found out the position i was in he hired me on in his floor care business which meant i was sweeping floors waxing floors at night I also went to the animal hospital where my then wife worked to help in the kennel, uh, which meant walking dogs and cleaning out poopy dog cages. So yeah. I went from the corner office, prestigious company, to literally cleaning up dog poop within two or three months. Yeah. Um, and so, so there's financial pressure brewing yeah increasing that's increasing the pressure at home it, it continuous cycle and of course that's increasing the self-medicating um so as i'm walking these dogs there's there's a open lot ba basically a small field next door to this animal hospital hmm. and as i'm sure you can imagine if you're walking one dog after another your head is on your step 
the whole time. You got to be careful yeah. about that. Yeah. I remember thinking that by the end of the day, after I'm done with that last dog, it my neck, shoulders, upper back would be it would be painful. Just just having your sight fixed on your feet that whole time as you're walking dogs. And I remember thinking how ironic this was at a time when professionally and emotionally I'm hanging my head. Now I'm hanging my head physically to the point where it's I, all three are painful, the professional, the emotional, and even the physical. Yes. Um, so in time, you know, so I'm sweeping floors by night, cleaning up dog poop by day. Um, had to file bankruptcy. Um, I'm, I'm getting uh, foreclosure notices in the mail uh, on my home. So I'm, I'm deeper into that cycle, deeper into depression, deeper into alcoholism. In time, uh, got back into the insurance world uh, uh, another company. It took a while. I, I tried sales along the way as well. That didn't mm -hmm. turn out very well. I got the good job, similar to what my responsibilities had been before, but by now the compulsion uh, was was firmly set. Can and I can I ask a question? Absolutely. On how that transpired, because. If you were self-medicating still at that time to get into another job, had you had you given up the self-medicating, the alcohol, or was that still there in the background? It was still there. Um, mm. be because, of course, it wasn't just the financial pressure that was leading to that. It was the family issues. Yes. Um, so those were still there. That was my number one trigger. Um, I felt very alone. Um, and by, by the time that job ended, divorce proceedings were, were underway. Yeah. Um, one Friday, I had the brilliant idea of sneaking in a bottle of vodka back in with me as I returned from lunch, was drinking it secretly at my desk, mm. um, but was discovered and terminated. So now on top of everything else, on top of the financial pressure, now I've got no job. Yeah. And so the whole, all right, what do I do now? Now I'm pretty much unemployable. I'm, I'm reach, have reached that conclusion. Yes. Everything at home was a complete mess. Mm. And so the following Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015, I wrote my suicide note. And uh, it was quite a dichotomy because on the TV in the background, this, this is in Kansas City, my mm -hmm. little apartment in Kansas City. And on the TV in the background is the Kansas City Royals World Series Victory Parade. Big, right. huge celebration throughout throughout the town yeah um 800 000 people gathered at the end of the parade route there um, which is more than twice the population of kansas city to begin with huge event and here i'm writing my suicide note with that on in the background and uh very specific plans um at 7 30 that night i i had bought three boxes of sleeping pills i'm going to pull into the garage close the door with the car running take the pills and that'll be it yeah and uh that afternoon my daughter calls me daddy can you pick 14 years old at the time can you pick me up from school tomorrow i need help with my math homework i say okay fine didn't mean it i'm not going to be around a couple hours later, she calls again, same question. A couple hours after that, a third time, she calls again, same question. Mm. And I'm each time I disconnect the call, I'm thinking to myself, is is that from God? You know, is is someone trying to tell me something? Mm. Well, then at 7:30 comes, so three times she's called, three times I've said yes, I'll be there. Didn't mean it. Yeah. Um 7.30 comes, 
I'm standing literally at the door with my car keys in my hand, my bag of the sleeping pills and my insurance policies, my life insurance policies in the other, and my phone rings. This time it's a friend of mine. Hey, Scott, I, I see you're not here. We were supposed to be getting together that night and you weren't here the other day when we were gonna be getting together. I just wanted to call and make sure everything was okay. Hmm. I disconnect that call. This time I know that came from God because when do guys do that? Guys never call up, hey, I'm worried about you. Are you okay? Um, so I'm like, okay, set everything down. I've got to just lay down and think for a while. A fourth time, my daughter calls me that same night, four times. Daddy, will you pick me up from school tomorrow? I need help with my homework. This time I say yes, and I mean it. Yeah. I did pick her up the next day. I ask her about her math homework. And she says, oh, I got help with it today. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and this is someone who was never that concerned about her math homework, believe me. So I'm like, okay, so now I've got to get myself back on my feet. Not sure how to do it, but I, I know that there's there's got to be some reason. Um, within a month, I got, uh, I worked, started working for a friend of mine. He was an insurance agent. He knew I had experience in the industry. I knew him. And so he hired me on not knowing all of this that had transpired. No. That date, Michael, that I wrote the suicide note, that date that was going to be my suicide date has become my sobriety date. I haven't touched mm. the date. I haven't touched a drop since then. Wow. So I'm like, okay. I, I go work to, to work for this insurance agent. It's basically customer service work. Wasn't very good at it. Not my thing. Um, but it kept my time and my mind occupied, which was by far more important than the money than anything else. Yes. That's what I needed. Keep my mind occupied. Keep my time occupied. I, I'm, I'm working... Um, I know it's not a long-term solution because by now I've, I've worked my way through the bankruptcy, but I'm you know, still a huge struggle financially. Now I've got spousal support to pay. Uh, the, the divorce became finalized a, a few months after yes. that. So I knew it wasn't a long-term solution. I was looking for something else, and I ended up getting into sales again, trying insurance sales again. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to learn Spanish more, keeping my mind occupied and my time occupied as I was home alone. S struggling, um, did one of those medical experiments where they have you take an unapproved uh, medication, you stay overnight at their facility so they can monitor your reaction to it as part of the approval process. Why? Because I felt my health was the most valuable thing I had to sell. Yes. Um, and you got money for it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get, yeah. Oh, that was the only reason I did it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, in time, you know, things are getting a little better, but still a struggle. So I'm trying to figure out the world of, of insurance sales. I have the insurance background, the financial services background. By this time, mm. 30 years of experience yeah. as far as knowing, knowing what the products do, how they help people. But as far as sales, you know, it didn't, I, my perception was the used car salesman who's trying to twist yes. people's arms. And that's not my personality. Couldn't do mm. that. So to, to try to, you know, to bring in the professional aspect of this. So I find out through a acquaintance, he, he had gone from one company to another and had called me up out of the blue to see if, hey, maybe I wanted to make the same change. One thing different about this uh, company he was with, they taught me this method the, the way they pitched it is a meth the best method for helping people to get out of debt. Yes. And, and that hooked me because I'm like, wow, what a huge problem that is. And I've got intimate experience at yeah. bankruptcy, at debt, at all that. 
And if I could, if, if this was legit, if, if I could figure out how to do that, that's something I could sell. Mm. The thing is, you know, my, my skeptic, my skeptical nature, I'm like, I don't care what it is. I don't care how it works until I first know who does this. Okay. If it's other broke people that are doing this, I want no part of it. So I dig in and research it before I commit to it. Yeah. Who, who uses this method? Turns out banks, wealthy entrepreneurs mm. use this method. Okay. So now, now I'm listening to the, what is it and how does it work aspect? And through my experience and through other connections that I had made, I'm like, okay, that's nice. The getting out of debt part is nice, but I want to help people go beyond that and, and form like a complete financial package that will not only help you work your way up to zero, which is what getting out of debt is. Congratulations. Yeah. When you succeed, you've got zero. Um, okay, I, I want to take people beyond that. How can I get them started investing? And how can I help in, in all sorts of financial ways? So I'm okay. So now I've got this basic core thing, but I've got these other things that I can kind of bolt onto that to expand that. One problem, one big problem. I've got this history of bankruptcy short selling my house, that medical experiment, you know, complete failure. And oh, by the way, I'm, I was a suicidal alcoholic too. So yeah. how can I get people to listen to me when it comes to me telling them what to do with their money? Yeah. I had a super hard time getting past that in my own head until one day I'm talking with a, a friend and I, I tell them, you know, hey, I've got this dichotomy that I'm struggling with. How can, how can I get past that? And he asked me the most profound question. He says, who would people rather learn from? Someone who's been there at the bottom and worked their way up or, you know, some trust fund baby born into wealth, never had any adversity. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm like, okay, I can take, this is the take your, turn your mess into your message thing. I can take the bankruptcy and the alcoholism and, and that hitting rock bottom and turn that into, you know, my recovery goes way beyond just the, the staying away from alcohol. My recovery yes. is financial, professional, emotional. All of those things combined are a part of the whole, the holistic recovery that I went through. And so now I wanted to help people holistically with their finances. Yeah. So, okay. So now, you know, the picture is becoming more clear. Mm. For me, I can help to find, find people where I have been and help them instead of just working their way up to zero, instead of, you know, there's, there's the common thought, the, the common wisdom, the traditional approach is if you've got debt, what you need to do is budget. You need to budget down to the bare bones. That's right. Not spend anything, um, and then in time, you'll you'll be in a better place. But the yeah. thing is, okay, so you will never shrink down to wealth. You will never restrict yourself down to growth. And I wanted to help people grow. Not it, it and. The whole budgeting approach, the bare bones budgeting approach to working your finances, it's a financial fad diet. You, you hear about these people that, that have these extreme diets 
And, and what happens when someone does that? Well, they lose a ton of weight for a few weeks, but then what? They end up putting it back on because they, you didn't change their mindset. You didn't give them an actual tool. You just told them, basically, don't eat mm. or only eat this. I, I, I used to work with this lady. She did this cabbage soup that uh in three weeks she lost i think it was 17 pounds and she's going on and on about how great she feels and how much more energy she has and after those three weeks she couldn't stand it anymore and she never had cabbage soup again and she gained mm. it all back plus a little more mm. and that's what happens when your whole focus your whole financial strategy is bare bones budgeting you yeah. haven't eliminated the the desire that people have to prosper you haven't eliminated the need that they have for professional accomplishment you you haven't eliminated any of the things that they need in fact there's been studies done that show the the brain's reaction to that bare bones budgeting is the same as if you tell someone on one of those extreme diets it's like basically the same as if you hold out an ice cream cone to them and you tell them, be strong, you can do it, resist. Mm. Mm. What does it do? It just increases their desire for it. Yeah. It's hardwired into the brain. And the way we react financially to bare bones budgeting is the same way we react to extreme dieting for weight loss. Fascinating. What's the yeah. effective way for weight loss? It's not focusing on losing weight. It's focusing on health, on yeah. healing your health from the inside out. It takes, you know, a, a sensible diet. It takes exercise. It takes a number of things. And, and I know that's not the focus of our conversation today, but financially, it's very similar. It's, hmm. I, I compare it, Michael, to the beginning of a marathon. Okay, if if you're the the Boston Marathon this year had twenty eight thousand five hundred runners in it on one street, so imagine what a mess that is. If you're at the back of that pack, you've got a long way to run just to reach the starting line, and then you've got twenty six point two miles to go. Yes, you're already tired before you even start. Mm. Financially speaking, if you're at the back of that pack, you're Getting out of debt is reaching the starting line. It's not the finish line. Key problem that people make is they make it their determination to get out of debt, thinking that's their finish line. So even if they succeed, what have they done? They've worked their way up to zero. They've reached yeah. the starting line. Mm. And now, oh, I accomplished my goal. I relax. Yeah. I, I relax that drive. And this is the 10% that succeed. Most don't get that far. And they don't realize that they've got farther to go. The finish line is actually what? It's retirement, it's passive income, it's financial independence, however you frame it. That's yes. the finish line, not getting, getting out of debt. That's just one mm -hmm. milestone along the way. So now what if through through this that uh, through this method, if I'm able to tell someone, okay, so that same energy that you use to reach the starting line, say you reach a starting line and now a race official calls you over, says, hey, Michael, come over here. I saw how far you had to come just to reach the starting line. I see you're already tired. That's not fair. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you into the course i'm going to drive you into the course and shorten that race for you yeah now that would be pretty cool you're basically taking that same energy that you expended to get out of debt and duplicating it to shorten your race to financial independence mm. to passive income that goes way beyond just preaching to someone don't spend budget Mm. that's actually giving them a tool, a tool yeah. that accomplishes something. It's not just buying a book 
hey, read my book. And if it fails, oh, well, you just you just aren't tough enough. <laughs> that, that's, you know, what the financial gurus, the financial entertainers. Yeah, that's their approach. I think I think just to interject that and give you a pause. I mean, it's fascinating how you, you know, you got in kind of backwards and forwards in and out of the industry doing some other jobs and then you got back into it and this fell into your lap mm-hmm. um by by way of then being able to help other people do the same thing again i think part of the problem is as i see it anyway because i've not been particularly good with money all my life there are pockets where I have been, and I think that the lack where I know the lack has been has been in education. Yes. You know that nobody in school teaches you money management. Uh, they don't even teach you budgeting. If if budgeting was the holy grail, which it isn't, as you are saying, they don't even teach you budgeting. So everybody then becomes an adult then realizes they need to get a job to pay the bills and then they need some extra money to entertain themselves. Yes. You know, and then you you talk about alcohol addiction, but there is spending addiction too, you know, so people overspend because they want to keep up with their neighbor, with their family member, with celebrities on TV uh, with society pushing you to show that you're wealthy, therefore people spend money unnecessarily on accumulating stuff yes. that they don't need uh, and, you know, get into debt even more that way. I mean, certainly I recognize in myself years ago, that's where I was for sure, you know. <laughs> um, so there is, there's a whole... What I'm kind of saying really is it's such a complicated issue that we've been conditioned in certain ways. And although I I, lo- I love your metaphor for getting to zero and beyond zero, that's really what the goal is, you know, focus beyond zero, not just to zero. But I think there is a part when you're at the back of the crowd coming up to zero, whatever. There's a, there's a whole mess, as you said. There's a mess there where people yeah. aren't educated. They're given the wrong information. We're bamboozled with the te- with the um, the language and the terminology that's being used by financial institutions, by governments. Oh, it's, it's just a mess. And whether it's in the US the United Kingdom, France, Spain, I think everybody is the same. You know, money is an issue. Yes, and you're 100% correct, Michael. Mm. The, the root of the problem is education. Yeah. But here, but here's the thing. Think back to your school years. Yeah. Were your teachers the, the right ones to teach you financial education? No. They're, they're W-2 employees that are struggling themselves. Yes. W-2, yeah. of course, being the, the U.S. tax designation. You know, yes. Whatever that's that's called where the listener might live, they're, they're working for someone else. Mm. And they're struggling themselves. Yeah. yeah. So then many people go to the financial services industry that they should be the ones to teach you. Yeah. But now you've got people who are tainted by where's where's the commission? Mm. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to push this because it's what I have access to sell. Yeah. And because I I make money for pushing this. So yes. what am I going to do? I'm going to push this. Mm. Whether it's the right solution or not. There's mm. so much of that. Okay, so here's here's the way that we educate ourselves. I went through that process because, one, I could not afford to fail again. 
Mm-hmm. I had tried guessing. I had tried listening to people who weren't qualified. I had tried all of that. Yes. And, and here's what happens. There's three basic processes that people use to try to figure out their finances. One is trial and error. They guess. They try this. They try that. Um, but the thing is, time only moves one direction. You lose yeah. time, you, you're you out of luck. Now, that is... That's a financial agnostic. Financial truth is unknowable. So therefore, I'm going to try a little, little of this, a little of that, and hope I stumble across something that makes me feel good. Yeah. The second thing that people do is they listen to their broke friends. That's a financial agnostic, or, uh, a financial atheist. There is no such thing as financial truth. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. So I'm going to strengthen the ties that I have to the people around me. And I'll listen to this one here and this one here and this friend over here, even though I know they've got no idea whatsoever what they're doing. (laughs) The The third thing is listening to one of those financial entertainers yell at you that their way is the only way and everything else is dumb. And that's a financial cult. It's follow the leader regardless of what they say. Yeah. The thing with each of those, the thing with each of those is that they there's no solid core there. There's no solid foundation to that. Mm. They each violate the laws of history and science. History shows us that banks and the wealthy have got it figured out. They're not guessing, they're not listening to broke friends, and they're not listening to Dave Ramsey tell them to not spend anything. Yeah. They know the way and they've left breadcrumbs so that we can scientifically, we can reverse engineer what they do. Right. And that is where the education comes from. It comes from one identifying who's not guessing, who knows. Identify the right person and then do what they do reverse engineer what they do. Right. So that eliminates your financial agnostics and atheists and cults. Right. Now you know you're on the right path. You know what the destination is because you've identified the result you want to get. You identify you identify the result you want first and you work your way backwards. Yeah. How did they get there? How can I copy it? And all of that in my case, came out of desperation. I was desperate to not fail one more time. Couldn't afford it. Couldn't do it. So basically, you're kind of modeling yourself then on other people who have been successful in the right way. Yes. But but, And you still have to be able to identify that they their way was the right way. <laughs> you you need to identify the right person. And, and yes. I'm certainly not encouraging anyone to go rob a bank because oh it worked for you know <laughs> you know uh, keep true to your ethics keep you know keep yeah. true to your your standards. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. So what what because if yeah. if I don't mention it now I might forget. Um, this is a fascinating discussion. I really love this. Thank you so much because you're really getting under the skin of it all. And in the age that we live in right now, I'm staying completely clear of things like Bitcoin and NFTs Mm. because I believe, because at the moment, if you were to believe the hype that everybody is spinning out there, whether it be on social audio channels, social media channels, TikTok channels, I don't even look that, YouTube, uh, you know, all of these people who are being billed as the gurus who have uncovered, you know, how you can make millions Mm -hmm. doing this stuff. Th- these are like well, who can you believe out there when that so much of that? I mean, I'm I'm sure 
there is a possibility to make money in those areas, but I don't believe anybody that's going on about it. Yeah. I'm sorry to throw that into the mix. No, <laughs> no. A, a very appropriate question. Um, the the whole cryptocurrency, one, I, I see logic behind it, the, the need for having deregulation of currency that crosses borders. Mm. To me, that makes sense. But the nagging question is my, my in my mind is what's the utility behind mm. it? Mm. D- did someone just invent? Oh, I just invented this thing. I'm going to call it Bitcoin. And even though it doesn't really have any value, I'm going to place a value on it and you know there there's parts of it that i struggle with right and there's so much now with bankman fried and and all that there's so much of that in the unstable coin world Mm. i know there are people that that have made good money Mm. uh, generally from the stable coins do I have cryptocurrency myself now? No, I don't. Right. And a key part of that is when it comes to any investment strategy, you want you need to understand it. And I have a hard time with that. I, I was a stats major in school. I, I need to see numbers. Yeah. And I need to understand the value that those numbers represent. And I can see it to an extent in the crypto world, but I haven't seen it enough myself to jump in. No. Um, And it goes back to the old adage, don't invest something that you can't afford to lose. Yeah. And that is the only way that I, when, when someone convinces me of the utility and underlying value behind the coins then i'll make that decision okay how how much do i determine it's not a big loss if i lose it and Mm. i'll put that in there Mm. i'm not at that point yet thank you for that yeah and and again you know my there's my skeptical nature there's the fact that i need to see the value underlying whatever it is that's going on that's what led me to the reverse engineering banks Mm. There, there's a good amount of unethical things going on in the banking world. Yeah. But the process, the the parts of the process, the tools that they use that we can reverse engineer, mm-hmm. that is, is a clear path to me. I can identify that clear path. I can pick up those breadcrumbs and I can see where they shorten that race. Right. Back to the marathon analogy. Yeah, yeah. And I can see how, you know, dating even all the way back to John D. Rockefeller, first billionaire in the world. Mm. You can trace this method back to him, um, back to others like that that have used a variation of of the the system that I'm using. And, yes. and when I see that, I'm like, okay, if that's something that has stood the test of time, that I get the value of it, then that's something that I can put my personal confidence in. And only after that point can I turn around and in good conscience tell something else, tell someone else about it. Yes. And, and that's what I am building. And that's the that's my professional mission that came out of hitting the rock bottom. Yes. It came out of the bankruptcy and all that to be able to help people see all right this is how i've climbed out of that hole yeah and 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 this is how it started this is why and here's how i can help you so with with the 
sorry, I'm doing it again, but with the reverse engineering, you, you I, when you when you discovered because you talked previously about a method mm -hmm. and or a, it wasn't a product was it it was a method that you you came across or um, was it a product in the insurance industry or it is a product in the insurance industry yes right so when you came across this did you while still being employed did you use that then to sell to was, people or did you go on your own or i i was already on my own i was already a, a struggling insurance agent um a, and this was you know a big spark that helped to turn that corner right let, let me go back to your question is it a is it a product or is it a method it's actually both right because the product itself, if, if you if you just bought it and, and you just stuffed that policy in your file cabinet and forgot about it, then all you've done is bought yourself an expensive insurance policy and that's it. Yeah. And there would be some benefit to doing that, but you wouldn't be leveraging your money to shorten that race. Yeah. So there is method to it as, as well. It's both science and art. Yeah. Because you have to, okay, now that I have this, how am I going to use it? How am I going to leverage it so that I can take that money that I'm using to eliminate debt and then leverage it so I'm basically using it again to build my to to build my financial independence and and michael it works a lot like real estate okay so at, at least here in the states every year you can count on getting from the county your tax appraisal and they'll say that the appraised value of your property based on sales made in the neighborhood and you know how big your house is and all that it has now change to this and, and generally it appreciates the value goes up yeah in the real estate world with with a few bl historical blips along the way it doesn't matter if you own that home free and clear or if you have a mortgage on it or even if you have a second mortgage on it in any of those cases the appraised value of that property stays this is going to be unchanged it's not connected to the loan that you have mm. if you own it free and clear if the value has appreciated it's going to appreciate just the same if you own it free and clear versus you have a second mortgage on it mm. okay? yeah so there's a financial vehicle where we can do the same thing where you the value of your account is going to appreciate it's going to grow and there are guarantees on that there's mm -hmm. also some dividend value to it so it's going to grow even as you take out a loan against that account to invest elsewhere right what i work with people to do is first thing you want to invest in is eliminate your bad debt yeah you want to invest in yourself, invest in your own business, so that now you know that that passionate thing that you've worked to build, you're building your skills at that. Yes. And then you know, in if you want to invest in real estate, if you want to invest in crypto, mm -hmm. you can do that in a way where you have a base account that's going to grow even if it turned out that maybe that crypto investment didn't pan out like you thought it should yeah you you've got cushion there yeah you, you've got arbitrage there that's in, in general terms that's the way i illustrate it for people it's mm. like appraise the value of your land that's going to grow regardless of whether you've got a loan against it or not. Mm. You can do that with your dollars. I call it recycling money. You know, you use up that bottle of Pepsi and you toss it in years ago, you tossed it in the trash 
and it ended up in a landfill. Now, what do we do? We've got the special recycle bin. Hmm. So it can be uh, cleaned. It can be, you know, whatever they do at the recycling plant so that we can reuse it again. Hmm. Yeah. And again, and again, we can do that same thing with our dollars, with yeah. our euros, where we can leverage it to invest elsewhere and get a percentage from it at the same time as we're getting a percentage from that base because the appraised value is growing. Yeah. Now we've gone beyond just buying an expensive insurance policy because now we're using it as a tool to put our money elsewhere while it's still growing. Basically, our money's doing two jobs at once. And so rather than listening to the, the debt gurus that say, buy my book, buy my book, and when that doesn't work, you silly weakling, why aren't you able to budget like you're supposed to? <laughs> he is, buy my next book. No, this isn't buying a book. It's having a tool that does something for you yeah. that enables you to have those dollars doing two jobs at once. Okay, just one second. I've got another question. Sure. Um, you, you do a really great job in explaining it. And huh, almost getting to the point of a bit of confusion <laughs> mm -hmm. for me anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. I'm not expecting you to be able to make it crystal clear for me, um, but there is still the the best way to explain it is there is still a an amount of uncertainty in my head. Yeah, yeah. That goes, huh? Okay. So if it was that easy. Why isn't everybody doing it? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Good. Fair question. R remember, I I'm I'm the skeptic. I had the same question to start with. I, mm. I needed to dig in. Um, first of all, I'm not saying it's easy. Right. Um, there, the funding is necessary to build momentum to yes. to to have this work. It, it's it's something that needs to be customized person per person. Mm. For one person, it might be easy because you know they they've got a whole bunch of disposable cash that they can throw at this. Mm. But that's that's not the art. No. The art of it, and what I do with people is I look holistically at what their financial snapshot is. Okay. Yes. L let's go back to the weight loss, the extreme weight loss example. You've seen those before and after pictures, mm. you know, before someone's a hundred pounds overweight and then the after picture, they're standing on the beach in a swimsuit looking incredible. Okay. Financially, the first step of my process that I work with in people is to take that before snapshot. Hmm what are your numbers now? I, I can show you case studies of what this has done for this person, for this person. Right. And that's great, but it's theoretical. What someone needs to see is their numbers and what it can do for them. Yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll take that before snapshot. I'll, I'll do my number crunching, run it through my software, and I'll then give you the after snapshot of what it can do for you. Will that work for everyone? No. Uh, for some people, unfortunately, I have to have that conversation with them of saying, you know, uh, at, at this time, I can't help you. Hopefully, you know, may, maybe there there's other parts of the process that I can do first. Yes. That will help you to get to that point where now we can give your money two jobs. Um, so, so sometimes I need to work it out of order. Right. Understood. Understood. Yeah. It is something 
generally speaking, there there's always skepticism, just like my skepticism at first. There's a good uh, amount of healthy skepticism is is a good thing, because yeah. then I'm able to tell people about the science of it. Here's how the numbers work. Here's why they work. Here's how I reverse engineered it. Yeah. Okay. This isn't this isn't just you know Scott in Kansas City that you've never met before telling you hey buy from me. This is what John D Rockefeller did. This is what Bank of America uses and you know others like that. Mm. And here's how it works for them. Here's how we know they use it. Here's the end result. I never ask people, oh, just trust me. You know, uh, but because th think about the financial education piece that we talked about earlier. Mm. Y your high school teachers, they, they weren't qualified to teach it. Your f financial advisors. Commission. <laughs> are they qualified to teach it? Probably, but they're also, they've also got commission breath. Mm. And so can you trust them? They may be qualified to teach, but can you trust what they're telling you to buy? I, I think trust is a massive thing that yes. you, you're touching on it now. So I want to, yeah. because, you know, I used to go to an organization networking breakfast meeting called BNI, which is American. Oh, <laughs> um, I used to be a chapter director decades ago and there was a gentleman that came into the meeting and he was the hundred pounds overweight gentleman who was a financial advisor every week at seven o'clock in the morning was over breakfast was sharing how he could help people and i didn't trust him <laughs> because I went, well, you're a hundred pounds overweight. How would I trust you? <laughs> um, and I had all these doubts and I didn't understand what he was talking about. I didn't appreciate it. I did my one-to-one -one meeting as you're supposed to have with your fellow breakfast people, networkers. And he was explaining stuff. And he said the kind of things he could do. And yeah, there was, yeah, definitely there was debt around. There were mortgages. There were this, that, all sorts of things. You know, I was earning really good money. My wife at the time was too, but it, it was a mess, you know. Yeah. So he helped us to sort some of the mess out. And then years later, I did hire him to do some stuff. And then years later, he handed his business over to somebody else because he was moving out of the area. And then that person, I then had to trust him again, you know, and go, okay, here's another one. I've got to get to know him. They then advised me on some, I had all sorts of pension pots all over the place. We combined them into one and it was the single best investment decision I had made in all my life. <laughs> and, I'm still reaping the benefit from that today. But I had a real issue with trust <laughs> because how can you possibly trust anybody to know best in terms of what they're going to do with your money? Yeah, exactly. And, and here's the thing with one of these commission breath guys. Um, the, the way they generally work is... Okay, so Michael, let me show you this prospectus here. You put money into this account here, and it's going to earn X percent. And so in however many years, this is what you're going to have. And then they ask, so how much you want to give me? That's the wrong question. Okay. And that's, that's how I really identify the commission breath guys is yeah. they ask you, how much are you going to give me? In my mind, a true financial advisor 
counselor isn't going to ask you how much money you want to give me, how much money you want to put in this. They're going to provide you the money to put into it. That's the before snapshot. If, if I can see, okay, so right now you're spending your money here, 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 here. In analyzing that, in putting it in my software and getting this proposal together, we can take what you're already spending and here, this portion of it here, you've not been uh, spending the, the best way possible. Yeah. If we take it and we move it over here, then without taking food off your table and without you digging any deeper into your pocket, now here's the numbers, here's the science that I'm able to do for you. Yeah. Okay. So now without taking the money off the table, without taking the food off your table and without digging deeper into your pocket, here's what this can do for you. Right. That, it, and underlying that is this method and uh, product that's reverse engineered from someone where you know what the destination is and you know that the path takes you there. Mm. So that is, trust is always an issue. Yeah. And, and that's something that, you know, anyone who is in any sort of sales industry has to has some struggle with how can I get people to trust me with their money? Um, that that's what I can do. Does it work hundred percent of the time? Absolutely not. Mm. Some people have been, have been ripped off before have been jaded by the yeah. system so much so that they're just not going to trust anyone. No, and, no. And, and I understand, you know, sad to say the the industry has gotten a bad name because there are some bad apples out there yeah. that have let people down often enough where they, they just shut it off and say, nope, not going to listen to anyone. I'm just going to, you know, stuff cash under the mattress. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And sad to say, I understand. Mm -hmm. It's not the best approach and uh i i can help to provide a, a process that works better than that but if they don't believe me i think i think what people just want is the um god honest truth yeah they just need to know you know is it black or is it white and is this going to work or is it going to fail? Uh, do you know or don't you know? You know, mm -hmm. don't bamboozle me. Don't yeah. <clears throat> lie. Don't just be straight. Yeah. I think that's what people want. They want somebody who who can go. This can work, but like anything else, there's no hundred percent guarantee that it will work. But I will do my level best to make sure you understand it inside out before you do anything with your money. Right, right. And, and so far in this conversation, Michael, I've, I've used a couple of examples mm. in, in, in things that are kind of in that same category. Mm. One is religion. We've, I've mentioned financial agnostics, atheists. Yes. Cults. Yeah. I need a comparison there. We've also compared it to weight loss. Yeah. There are people who are just 100% convinced that, religiously speaking, that they, they've got it. Yeah. There are people with respect to weight loss mm. who are just 100% convinced that their way is... Is the way. way, yeah, yeah. And... It, it, but... Overall, those topics, most people consider them to be incredibly nebulous and mm. even mysterious. Mm. You've had so many people that have done the fad diet thing so many times that now you could be in perfect 
condition and provide them with proof that you're not on steroids and, and that you're 100% healthy and they still won't believe you because they've right. made it so many times. Yeah. You know, what, what can we do? What can I do? What can we do as professionals? We can try to show people that, okay, I didn't just invent something. I reverse engineered it from a process that has consistently worked for year after year and for mm -hmm. multiple people and industries. Yeah. 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 And I can show you that. And I can provide the same benefit for you. Now, banks, of course, they've got some regulatory advantages that we don't have as consumers. Can we down to the letter do everything mm. they do? No. But no. I can show you, okay, a particular method that they use that is available to us as consumers. Brilliant. And it is a tool that helps us to give our dollars to jobs, helps us to eliminate debt quickly, gives us a platform from which we can we can uh, uh, withdraw money to leverage elsewhere, even as its appraised value continues to rise. We can do that. It's, it's the, it sounds amazing. And, and thank you. I'm sorry that I keep throwing questions at you. Perfectly uh, fine. And, and you're doing really well answering them all. So I really appreciate it. Um, is there a name for this product? Is it? Or method is there? What is, what is it called? The the name for it is called infinite banking. You you can Google it. You can mm -hmm. read up all about it. Yeah, um, and how it works. Um, infinite banking concept. Right. Um, and again, it it won't work with a hundred percent of the people out there. No. Um, but if it does, it works great. Um. There are, like I mentioned, there's other things I've kind of bolted onto it, mm. onto that machine that can help to accelerate things even more. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, stuff I've taken from the accounting world and helping people to save taxes. Right. Um, software that's been developed in managing debt. There, there's another process called velocity banking, also something you can Google and, and learn about that is a really good process to help to accelerate. Yeah. There, there are a number of different tools out there where you're not just buying somebody's book. You're not just hearing someone preach budget. No. Budget. Yeah. You're actually, you're, you're, you have something that is provides utility it is doing something there is whether it's art or science or both you're putting something together that is accelerating the growth of your money shortening that race wow fabulous well thank you scott it, it's it's it sounds promising let's put it that way and the fact that you've invested your time and energy in this and running it for your own business helping people with it is, is fantastic so how can people you know get in touch with you to find out and learn more about this and get into detail with you yeah right. thank you for asking my website is never too much money <laughs> And two is spelled out, T-O-O, nevertoomuchmoney.com. Mm. There you'll see my uh, links to connect with me on social media, mm -hmm. my email address. Um, let me know if you want more information. I'll be glad to uh, reach out to you, yeah. nevertoomuchmoney.com. Very easy to remember, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody will agree there is never too much money. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Even for Elon Musk, <laughs> there's never too much money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there, is there anything that I haven't asked that you would have liked to have shared? Oh, wow. Well, we covered quite a bit of ground there, Michael. I think uh, we've got just about all that I might have wanted to say. I, I will reiterate, you know, the best... The, the best way for me to 
present this to someone is to present it with your information, your numbers. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, again, reach out to me, never too much money.com. And I'll be glad to put together a proposal for you. And is that, uh, do you charge for those kind of number crunching bit? I, I do. Um, in it, but it's kind of a moving target, right? Um, since the first thing I do is I take in that before snapshot and, and, and what I come up with as a result of that, any mm. rudimentary debt tool that someone can use, that's free. That that's free of charge just for reaching out to me. You'll, okay. You'll get some benefit from that. Right. If you want to go higher level and actually have that tool that will help you to ha give your dollars two jobs. That is uh, something that, you know, we will uh, figure out the cost for that. Yes. Um, but given that I know the situation, okay, well, I know you've got this debt and I can't just, you know, I, I can't portray the solution to you as being taking on more debt. Mm -hmm. I will make sure that it's something that's affordable to the extent that I can. Okay, that's fair enough. That's very kind of you. Okay, Scott, this is brilliant. It's been a great conversation. And yes, again, thank you. thank thank you for answering all my <laughs> my my pressurized questions in terms of you know, um, I, I, I'm it just applies to me just as much as it will do to lots of other people. So I'm just putting myself in the situation, you know, being on the receiving end having been on the receiving end as well uh, yeah. throughout my life. and uh, But it's very useful and certainly very fascinating. And out, out of interest, is this, do you know whether the infinite banking solution is available in other parts of the world or is it only in the it's, U.S.? It is available in the U.S. and Canada. Those are the only places I have found where I where it can be used directly, right? Got you. Um, there are other parts of you know the bolt-on parts of my process where I can help uh, people in other parts of the world as well. Got it. Great. And, and you've asked great questions, Michael. I I appreciate that. I'm sure <laughs> there's some questions that all the listeners uh, had, and and no doubt more as well. I'm sure yeah. they will have more too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One last thing I thought of that I wanted to mention. Yes. Um, just to connect this back to the personal story. Um, yes. Now, very happily remarried. Uh, the, oh. the the success of the the rebound professionally, emotionally, physically, all of that um, has has really been fulfilling. And to be able in in to whatever extent it mm. may be that I can help others on their journey is is a joy well it's amazing what you've achieved and that you were so close to not being here and i'm grateful to your daughter and to your friend for literally just grabbing you by your coattails and mm -hmm. go stay here and yes. otherwise you wouldn't have been here to share it on the podcast so i'm very grateful you are still with us on this planet, uh, Scott. Yes, me too. Thank you, Michael. Take care and do keep in touch. Yes, I will. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.